Welcome to Words That Move Me, the podcast where movers and shakers like you get the information and inspiration you need to navigate your creative career with clarity and confidence. I am your host, Dana Wilson, and I move people. I dance, I choreograph, I coach, and the only thing that I love more than learning is sharing. So if you are someone who loves to learn and laugh, and you're looking to rewrite the starving artist story, then you're in the right place. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the podcast. I am so glad that you're here. How are you doing today? <laughs> today, I am doing, I'm feeling hopeful. I'm feeling hopeful because I think change is good. <laughs> I took a walk. And uh, I took notes on the interview from this episode under a clear blue sky from the bleachers of an empty baseball field. Field? Is that the right word? Diamond? Baseball diamond? Baseball court? (laughs) Baseball stage? (laughs) Um, Anyways, that setting was indeed quite a change from my standing desk at home. I do think change is good. Um... Also, I might as well mention that I'm recording this on Inauguration Day. It is the first time I've actually watched an inauguration top to bottom, and I'm so glad that I did um, for many reasons, but namely because I got to witness and be tremendously moved by the words and the movement, I might add, of Amanda Gorman. Wow. Listening to her... (laughs) And watching her calm, steady, and graceful hands as she spoke turned me into a puddle on the floor. But not like a boogery, wet, ooey-gooey puddle, but like a titanium, indestructible puddle on the floor. So strong and yet so full of tears is, is how I felt. This episode will air one week from today, and I will probably still be in complete awe of Amanda, um, especially her in that very moment. I simply think she is outstanding. Yet, I think there are more like her, and that is why I'm hopeful. Speaking of more like her, bright, wise, beautiful, and a master of their craft from a very early age. Today, we are joined by Galen Hooks. Galen is a friend and a leader, and I am so excited to be sharing this conversation with you today because, wow, (laughs) if this podcast really is about navigating your creative career, then consider this episode a compass. (laughs) Please enjoy this conversation with the fabulous Galen Hooks. Galen Hooks, my friend, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Dana. (laughs) Thank you so much for being here. I'm simply thrilled about this and oddly embarrassed that as friends, this will probably be our longest session of talking uninterrupted in years we have not talked in a very very long time and so this will be a great catch-up i'm so i'm so excited about it um okay so this is how we always begin with guests on the podcasts i would like to ask that you introduce yourself i know that this can be a daunting (laughs) task but um let us know anything that you would like us to know about you um so i'll just kind of introduce myself in a way that for anyone listening helps you understand some context for whatever I do talk about. My name is Galen Hooks. Um, I am a VMA nominated choreographer. I started working in the industry when I was seven and I have known nothing but the entertainment industry. I've worked with over 70 artists. If you're kind of old school, you might know me from the Neo videos or Janet or even LXD, but because this is the age of social media, some of you um, might have learned about me through some viral videos like River or Love on the Brain, et cetera. Um, And now in addition to doing industry work, I have the Galen Hooks Method, which 
I might even have some alum who are listening to this, but um, I do the Galen Hooks Method, which is made up of several kinds of experiences from two-day really intimate intensives to regular length master classes, lectures, live events. Um, it's global, it's open to everyone, and I am glad to be here, Dana. Thank you for having me. Ah, oh, it is my absolute pleasure. Um, so yes, yeah, 70 plus artists, <laughs> holy smokes, really to list your dance and your choreography credits would require a, a double episode, <laughs> probably <laughs> a back-to-back. And so I'm not going to get into that. And I know that we'll talk about dance eventually, but I, I want to start by talking about your work as an activist and how that has transferred into the Galen Hooks method. Um, so could you maybe start by talking about those 10 plus years that you chaired Dancers Alliance? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I did, what I didn't mention in my beginning spiel is I, for 10 years, I was, um, both working with Dancers Alliance and serving on the board at SAG AFTRA. So it was like that was at SAG before SAG was SAG AFTRA. Right. And um, worked with AFTRA at the time closely and was a liaison for the agents and just did tons and tons of activism. And during that time, um, Dana, as you know, because you were heavily involved, we spearheaded unionizing music videos and Dana was instrumental in helping us unionize what I think was the only tour that got unionized. Am it's I possible. That? I'm, unfortunately, I think you might be, you might be right. The biggest like win and lose at the same time. Yeah. So, the, so yeah. Um, so I spent a, a very long period of time being an activist in the community and helping with, helping make, I guess when I say activist, I think now, oh, how do I explain this? We made really, um, tangible changes in uh, contracts and unionizing. And that was always my really driving force was making actionable change. Um, so of course now the baton has been passed as it should be to dancers who are now currently working. Obviously I don't work as a dancer anymore. Um, so when I do the intensives, um, I have industry, sessions for the Galen Hooks Method and non-industry sessions. And so the industry sessions are for professional dancers and there's another session for aspiring choreographers. And in both of those instances, it's just important to uh, make sure in practice people know how to apply concepts like what's happening in your contracts or how to deal with your agent or what to do if you get in a sticky situation. Basically in the, in the sessions, I'm able to communicate the things that we would typically do in our DA meetings. Mm -hmm. And then for the choreography session, it's really kind of bananas how even <laughs> like our colleagues now and people who are my elders as choreographers still don't know answers to a lot of questions because there isn't much codified language for choreographers. So right. we'll go through everything from what your rate should freaking be, which like I get calls <laughs> all the time from my friends asking what oh, to negotiate. I'm sure you do. I'm so sure. <laughs> I mean, like, not, like when I think about it, a lot of, I, I consult a lot of people on their negotiations, what, like on what to ask their agents for, on what to ask their man managers for, not to say that that's a form of activism, but it's like a daily kind of dealing with negotiations and rates is still a huge part of my life, even though I'm not working with an organization. Mm -hmm. But in the GHM creative session, we go through the basics, like what your rates should be to more, um, uh, applicable questions like if you are hired as an assistant and you're asked to contribute creatively, what should you do to do you get paid to run an audition? What like all kinds of things that even now working choreographers don't necessarily know the answers to. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of like on the dance end, but then really I, the, the dance industry has, I don't know if fractions the right word, but it's split off into even more kind of bubbles than I think had existed when we were doing DA. And so my, I know that I have an immediate community of people who I can activate as people and citizens as well, I guess. So mm. certainly like an element of just human activation has come into play and definitely in the past year. So uh, you know, we got people to register to vote and to phone bank for Biden and write letters to the George Floyd family and, um, you know, raise money for the Actors Fund or Feeding America. So there's kind of like this, the sense of activism has expanded 
beyond dance, which is wonderfully fulfilling for me and just nice for dancers to be able to come together in a non-dance sense as well. Mm, on like on, on a human plane. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I love this. That that we'll have to adjust your bio slightly to include the title of unofficial consultant to all on, <laughs> on all things. <laughs> Um, well, okay, so let's flash back a little bit. You mentioned the music video negotiations and the touring negotiations. That was certainly when we logged our most time together. Yes. Um, and I, I became aware of how much work is done behind the scenes at the <laughs> and, and in other organizations that um, Dancers Alliance is a non-union non -union organization. And by the way, if you are not familiar at first listen with Dancers Alliance, I will absolutely be linking to the DA website in the show notes. That should be your next stop after you listen to this episode. Um, but from my experience with, with organizing, I learned, I think if I had to boil down a takeaway, that education and outreach must be almost constant in order to make a lasting impact. Um, and I think that that's what you're doing with the Galen Hooks method is pretty much around the calendar doing that education and outreach. Um, what, what else did you take away from that time? Any like big life-changing lessons learned from doing all that work in organizing? <laughs> the, can, the When you try to articulate the amount of work it takes to organize, and I think now people one fortunate thing is that people are getting a tiny taste of what it is to organize in just going to protests. And I think like the stamina that it takes to consistently care about something mm -hmm. is so underestimated by people who get riled up and want to make a change. And I want to kind of like put for anyone who's listening, I want to just put this in the context of if you're listening and you feel like you recognize injustices, whether it's you think your rate should go up or whether it's racial injustice, um, and you have an inkling of what you know needs to happen to fix that injustice, you're going to hit multiple steps around the way where you just get so freaking worn out. And when I say I did it for 10 years, most people burn out after like a month. Like, you know, mm -hmm. this, Dana, it's like you get really excited and jazzed about, I want to change. I want I want the rates to go up, whatever it is. And then you book a job and then all that goes out the window. So for me, like I, a lot of the time I spent, which by the way, just in case this isn't clear to people working for dancers Alliance, it's hundred percent volunteer work. You don't get paid. Yeah. It is absolutely on your own time. So whether it was when Dana and I were working with DA or the people that you know currently are working for DA, they are doing it in the spare time that they have in their lives. So I would be in China, I'd be in Europe, I'd be at like 4 a.m. organizing PowerPoint presentations and um, you know doing phone calls with SAG. And it's like you have to have it just takes so much mental stamina. Yes. So, and I, th and I think, you know, I, I started the intensives before kind of this huge wave of intensives that currently is taking place. And I think a lot of people, it takes a lot of stamina to do something like an intensive and whether it's, whether it's the activism with Dancers Alliance or whether it's the Galen Hooks method, I'm not doing it for the sake of saying, I run a business and I do these intensives and like there wasn't, I didn't, I had no intention of the Galen Hooks method becoming a thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I do it because I care. So I'm able to continue doing it because I care. And that's what it takes that level of stamina, not to say that other people that do intensives don't care, but you have to have a huge amount of care and desire to make a difference to keep going after the initial uh, excitement has worn off um, because 99% of the work that goes into these things is not fun. It's not sexy. It's not like cool stuff to do. So I certainly, that's a long winded way of kind of reminiscing on that time of the uh, music video negotiations or the tour negotiations. Um, there's like, there's so much te like literal tears. I remember talking to you, Dana, and it was, it's so emotionally fraught and you want to, quit at so many points because there are so many hurdles along the way. So the mental and emotional stamina is absolutely imperative for any cause to continue forward. Mm -hmm. You need a strong why. 
you need to have a strong why. <laughs> like you yeah. have to know exactly why you're doing it. And if it is money and if it is a reputation or, uh, you know, praise, uh, that won't be enough <laughs> for this type of work. It simply won't be enough. Um, so what would you say now is your why? Like what is your North Star at the moment with the program and in your, and in your creative life? It's, geez, we, so we are recording this like a week after the Capitol was stormed, not even a week. And uh, uh, it's such a ch change, I guess, for me of my North Star, because what happens every day for us as people is we just, it's a grab bag. So I, I don't think I've ever had a, an exactly enumerated North Star or mission statement or why that's kind of written out. Mm -hmm. I have a really, I really listen to my gut and know when I'm going in a direction that feels right. And I really know when I'm not. Mm -hmm. So kind of, it's like every day I wake up and it's like, what, are, what's happening in the world today? And I follow what feels right to do with the time and energy that I have to give to make things happen. So I, I genuinely do not have a, an exactly specified North star other than like, what, how can I best use the, uh, like assets that I have to do something for people. That is huge. And that makes total sense to me. I'm now, <laughs> my brain is offering me this image of not a due north, like not a North star, not a, not a one mission statement or mantra, but just a compass that works really well. Totally. I, think, <laughs> I think you have a strong moral compass, which is probably why most people come to you um, for advice or consultation, help negotiating things that, or negotiating or navigating things that they haven't done yet. So that's, that makes complete sense to me and I love it. Um, <laughs> so let me, if, if we could talk a little bit about the Galen Hooks method for a second. Um, I know that you work with professional dancers and like varying degrees of experienced dancers. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that some of my listeners are alum and I'm sure that a lot of my listeners would be interested in training with you. So I'm wondering what you think is the biggest difference between a layperson dancing and an aspiring pro dancing and what could they learn from each other? Hmm. Um, let me just for good measure explain each of the sessions because it'll help with my explanation. Mm -hmm. So they're from, from like beginner to industry, the sessions are GHM light, which is for absolute beginners. Uh, you can't, you shouldn't be advanced in that one. That is for hobbyists basically. Mm -hmm. And then there's GHM classic, which is a mixed levels one. So that one I will have absolute hobbyists with professional dancers and it's about artistry. Mm -hmm. GHM pro is only professional dancers. Creative is for aspiring choreographers. Mm -hmm. And then game plan is for the people that are trying to get a game plan to work in the industry. So when I'm doing, for example, GHM Classic, which is the mixed levels, hobbyists and professionals in the same room, honestly, the approach is exactly the same for every single person in that room. And everyone is at a literally the same equal playing field. So my approach to teaching them is absolutely the same whether they've never danced a day in their life or they're veterans who have done it for 20 years if it's a pro session I guess this is how I would answer it like the pro session or any pro master classes that I've done or audition intensives anytime I'm dealing with people who are trying to work and are taking their career seriously it is like no nonsense and very high high stakes um, but if I'm working with a room of only beginners, then obviously we're going way back to basics. So I guess the way I'm answering that is if I have a mixed group of people in the same room, everybody is dealt with the exact same way. But if I've got only beginners, I'm dealing with them one way and only pros is the other way. And they're both like, I think what I've loved <laughs> is being able to be so high stakes with the professional dancers. I think like, you know, when we, when you work with an actor, I I've had, both of us have had experience working on film, TV, commercial work where you're working with non-dancers and that's kind of like, I, I'm, I'm used to in my career working with absolute beginners who don't speak the language of dance. So it's less of like a switching teaching wise with those people, but what has been so awesome is being able to just crack the whip 
with professional uh -huh. dancers because on a job, it's like I'm, the way that I'm training professional dancers is much different than the way that I would treat them on a job. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really fun, I think, on both of our ends, whether you're the <laughs> student or for me, to have like a different way of approaching teaching professional dancers. I think I'm just now wrapping my head around this like training for professional work can be professional work in the moment. Like you can be treating that training moment as the professional moment. And for many of the dancers in your program, it is. In some senses, I'm sure the thought behind at least some people's head is this is an audition. This is a person who works all the time and I'm in front of them day after day after day. And every day I show up is, if I treat it as a day on the job, I'm maybe that close, that much closer to being on the job with Galen. Um, it, is that a mindset that you would recommend or do you think that, or what would you recommend for people coming into your program as being the most beneficial mindset? Like how will we get the most out of it? I'm t honestly, the, the pro session is not, none of these sessions are meant for you to work with me. That happens. And I've hired many of my alum following their sessions, but that's not the goal. So the pro session, I'm trying to get you to work with everybody, like of every dance style, of every genre of choreographer. So we're, the mindset is to be adaptable, to be smart. You know, everyone talks about being a smart dancer, but mm -hmm. you don't understand that or see it in practice until you're thrown into the lion's den. Right. And like, <laughs> so, so the, the, it's really, you can't, if you can imagine Dana, like trying to prep for doing the traffic scene in La La Land, but you've never been on a set before, there's mm -hmm. not really a way to prep for how to deal with all of the elements that happen unless you are thrown, you can't learn except for, from experience. Right, you will not know how to do it until you have actually done it. Until you've done it and you learn so much from doing. And so the my, a lot of people will ask beforehand, like what should I prepare? How do I like come mm -hmm. into this thing? And you've got to just come in as a blank slate because the learning is not in prepping for the session to come in with the right heads mindset. You come in with a blank slate and I, for each person in the session, because they are very small capacity, 15 to 30 person sessions, every single person in that room, I'm customizing the training I'm giving to you based on where you're at. So you, you can just come in having just like woken up and rolled out of bed and I'm gonna adjust what's happening based to where you are. Mm -hmm. um, so there's not, yeah, I, I, but <laughs> the bigger picture of what you're saying is like, yes, you should a thousand percent like come in being professional and um, presenting yourself in a way that for me as Galen Hooks that I go like, I like this person and I'll recommend them. I think that's the other thing is that mm -hmm. I'm recommending people the same way that people are hitting me up all the time asking what to negotiate for the contracts. All the time people are hitting me up and I'm sure hitting you up. We all hit mm -hmm. each other up going, do you know a blonde? I'm, my blondes are all booked, I need a blonde. <laughs> so I'm recommending people all the time. So it's, it's not just in my intensives, but any class you take, going to Carnival, going to Starbucks when we're able to go places again, like you should always be aware of the hiring potential of the interactions you're having with anybody, not just me. Mm -hmm. Ah, fabulous, fabulous advice. Um, and also, I took a tiny note, because as you were talking about not knowing until you've done it, I was remembering all of the hundreds of times master teachers or my own teachers have told me, uh, and all dancers, I think this is the thing we all often hear, um, make good choices. Hey guys, just make good choices. And good is so relative. And also when you're coming up, you haven't established your taste yet necessarily. So you might not know, you might not know what a good choice is or uh, much less how to actually make it. So giving a place for people to practice good choices or experiment good choices or audition good choices and bad choices, I think that's so valuable. Do, do you mean creative choices? Yes. Let me just like- Or like, or like dance, dance choices. Dance body, choices. Body choices. <clears throat> so that, that's so interesting. I'm just gonna like respond to that because I, I don't, this isn't to contradict what you're saying, but- Oh, do it, bring it, yes. Just to explain how, it, how, uh, how I would um, plant in somebody's head who's listening. Mm -hmm. I don't, 
operate in thinking of choices as a dancer or artistically. So what, what, I, what I think a lot of people, what's holding back a lot of aspiring dancers is that you're not thinking about, if we're in a rehearsal setting or in an audition setting, you're not thinking about serving the job. And so, um, if you're going to be making dance choices, you've got to be thinking of what the job is calling for. And the way that people are training right now is uh, it, it's holding back the choreographer from being able to get certain jobs done because the choices people making are making are in a bubble and in a vacuum of what they're excited about creatively as their own individual dancer, but they're not choices that make sense for what's being called for in the shot. Mm. So take what Dana's saying about making choices and, and being creative and having the space to fail, which I want to say in the pro intensive, that is not the place to fail. It's the, it's not that like, <laughs> cause I just want to be really clear in case anyone signs up for it. It's not a, it's not the pro intensive specifically is not a nurturing environment because I'm preparing you for what it's like to actually work on the high level jobs. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess what I'm trying to articulate is it's incredibly important to do what Dana is suggesting of making those creative choices, but there's the people who work all the time, make those choices, knowing what the shot's supposed to be and knowing what the choreographer is asking for. Uh-huh. Um, I think there's tremendous value in that. And I think I'm learning like our, a bit of the difference in you and I, in, in our training on the come up, um, you know, you spent a lot of time assisting and working with Marguerite Derrick. She runs a very tight ship. She knows exactly what she wants, but I have spent equal, maybe more. I don't know. I would love to see an hourly side-by-side -side catalog, um, of time with Marty Kadelka, who, like packages improvisation and hires and works exclusive exclusively with people who he knows will default to a freestyle or or a um an an unplanned moment that is in alignment with the vision so that's what i would consider a good choice is one that is an in alignment with uh, what the job is asking for. And right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I think if we also zoom out a little bit, and this is a fun, this is a really cool thing, actually, I'm excited to talk about. Um, I, I have developed over the course of the podcast, a community of doing daily doers. <laughs> they are people who have taken on the challenge of making a creative work every single day. Several of them are in the 200s by now. Oh um, my I've gosh. Got more people joining every single day. And the objective, almost solely, <laughs> the objective of that project is to claim agency over your own work, is to not have to answer to anyone and simply make something every day, not necessarily because you're inspired or because you have an, uh, an inner creative voice that you want to get out, but simply because you said that you would. It's strengthening a creative muscle and putting the power back in your own hands in an industry where we so often give it away to the choreographer or to the casting director or to whoever. So um, to give us a full like 360 degree view of good choices. I think good choices serve the project and you. And I don't think that a dancer should ever have to sacrifice uh, their anything for a project. It's a dancer's choice if they would like to be there. But so many people, especially at the end of a one year plus pandemic, are thinking, oh man, work would be real great right now. I will do whatever it takes, mm -hmm. including put my um, creative impulses in the, uh, in the sidecar. Yes. But I think it's really interesting. I really do. I am, I default to nurturer in all of, in my, in my teaching and in the podcast and in this project where, where people are doing daily, I find it so easy to get critical. In fact, that's probably the number two reason to do it is it really helps combat the perfectionist syndrome. If you're trying to ship a creative work every single day, certainly not all of them will be perfect. So it's a really interesting muscle to strengthen. But like, if is creativity called for on a professional job? I think it depends on what the professional job is and who it is that you're working for. So often offerings are, you know, being a person that has good ideas, um, good instincts and good 
offerings can be a thing that gets you the job, but equally, probably an equal amount of the time, it could be what loses you the job. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, what I think the, the only thing I'm distilling down is you have the context of knowing, knowing what choices serve the job and don't. Mm -hmm. And what I see sometimes now is because how do I, like, if you're making those choices outside the context of being on a job, sometimes, sometimes there's a misunderstanding of what making a creative choice means. Mm -hmm. um, so do we, so it's, it's wonderful that you're having people practice that creative muscle so that when you are, when it is asked of you, because although, although I assisted Marguerite, certainly there are times when if you, if you work with Jamaica craft, she's mm. like a thousand percent asking those creative choices from you. So it's so important, like taking that ability to do daily and then having that added layer of like, when you're asked to do that on a job, then it's, an, it's being creative in, in the confines of a job is creative in, a, in and of itself. And that's like yes. exciting that you're getting people to get the juices going because, yes. you know, doing daily without limitation is different than doing it on a job. And it must be much more uh, easy for people to do it in the confines of a job if they're used to doing it on their own so much. Yes. I think you're totally spot on in in taking on a daily creative challenge you like you plant yourself in the pilot seat of the of this like creative cockpit and in front of you all the dials and knobs and levers are there and one of them is like the sensitivity to read the room or the ability to look to the person who is uh, who, who is leading the room and like dial up and down all of your creative knobs and levers accordingly after like you know, checking the altitude and whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and walk away from that analogy now because I know nothing else about <laughs> about <laughs> aviation <Lovely> buttons. <laughs> uh, levers. I think we got a lever in there. Um, okay, cool. So I I love that. I'm fascinated with like the ways that we can be um, aware of what's being asked and meet that meet the expectation through practice, right? Through training. Through yes through yes definitely through experience but also through just a willingness to like do it and maybe do it wrong but do it over and over again until you get it right um a question about how you devised the galen hooks method i think your experiences are so vast and so many from being on big screens, huge artists, tremendous audiences to being a producer, not just of your own works. Um, one of my favorites of all time still is Campfire Vaudeville. Um, but then you also went on to produce larger scale productions for The Voice and so on and so forth. So I guess um, I, I, I guess what I'm wondering is how, hmm, let me, what am I wondering? When I, when I imagine you creating the Galen Hooks method, I see you in your bat cave hovered over a beautifully lit drafting table, <laughs> with like spreadsheets and flow charts and like your actual Batman in my eyes. And you've got Fox and you've got Alfred and this like, <laughs> and this den of, of brilliance um is that how that happened or was it <laughs> a trial, not, trial not an error? that's a very romanticized version no not um, at all leave, leave it to me <laughs> to make a romanticized a very very dramatic like <laughs> a marvel action version of everything <laughs> um like i kind of alluded to earlier i didn't intend for it to be something so it started as audition intensives because i was running auditions and felt just terrible for people who were getting cut for reasons they had no idea about that are very easily fixable mm. and because i was a dancer for so long when I became a choreographer i was like are you for real why doesn't anyone tell us how to audition this is criminal to me that we're like spending all of our lives training and then like our hair's not right and that's why we're getting cut so I started doing audition intensives and it was just called behind the audition and then I started doing heels intensives because heels became a thing and 
obviously when I was dancing as a professional dancer, there weren't heels classes. You just like booked the job and they gave you heels and you danced in heels. <laughs> but um, I really it's saw true. like, <laughs> I saw a, um, I saw the desire for people who wanted to dance in a heel, but not dance in the way that most heel classes were taught. Mm -hmm. So I was doing heel, heels intensives. And then, so the people that were doing the audition intensive were then booking jobs based off of what they did in the intensive. So then they would say, what should I do on the job? I don't know what to do in rehearsal. I don't know how to sign my contracts. So then I did an on set intensive. So the Galen Hooks method, quote unquote, became what it is because I was actually sitting with our friend Amanda Balin, and we were, I was just kind of like, it's, it's, it's an approach to the, the entire industry. And because I've been doing this since I was a child, I have like a, a way that I philosophically approach the industry that I recognize is just my way of doing it. So it's my, I, I call it the Galen Hooks method because this is my one approach. And I know that there are other, there's not one way to do this. So this is just my way. Mm -hmm. um, but it was not concocted as like, I want it to be, I just haven't, I had no intention and I still have no intention of, you know, it, of like building an empire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's all just out of a desire to fill what I see are gaps in how dancers are trained. And certainly now, because I you know, it started off as the, everything I've named so far is completely industry related. Mm -hmm. And now there are sessions that have absolutely nothing to do with the industry because I'm just kind of following, as I said before, I follow my gut. And so I don't have things that are really pre-planned. So I, even in a year, I don't know what the session, I mean, by the end of this year, I don't know what the sessions will be because uh, everything changes and the format of the sessions change mm -hmm. drastically over the years and what we do in the sessions change. So the, yeah, the, the making of it was not, was certainly not in a proverbial bat cave kind of like <laughs> thinking about what I want to do and making it a uh, strategic. It, none of it was strategic and none of it is strategic. And I'm very thankful for anybody who signs up because I'm just doing what feels necessary in the moment mm -hmm. without any kind of expectation that it will turn into anything, anything or that people will come. So <laughs> thank you to anybody who comes, but yeah, that's kind of the genesis of it. Okay. I think that that is also a very romantic telling of it. And I think it's beautiful that this like keeping a finger on the pulse of a, what the, what your community is looking for or needs or could benefit from. And then also keeping the finger on the pulse of where you are, what you've experienced, what you have to offer. I think that makes all the sense in the world and is also beautiful. Thanks. Um, okay. So I've known you to be like in, in the past, you have a extremely strong voice and we already talked about the strong moral compass, um, but I've known you to be somewhat introverted. And I know that a lot of the people that I work with are the same and that they believe that that somehow might keep them from building a global brand or from, um, you know, being a person that can be comfortable in a spotlight. So I would love to hear a little bit about how you manage um, popularity and dare I even call it celebrity and being a front of this, of, of this. Well, I think it's, you know, you know, what's funny, actually, let's sidebar for a second. I, a hundred years ago, um, when I, I don't remember if these two thing, things lined up exactly, but might've been around campfire vaudeville time. I roughly um i was working on a youtube series called more than moves and it was i the it was my show yeah the talk show yeah. it was, it, was yeah. it was my dream that it be like uh like the chelsea handler of dance except for i say i, I swear slightly less often um <laughs> <laughs> but when when I when I like headed out into the world creating that show, my mission was for dancers' names to be household names, and that was it. I was like, I want people to to I want Galen Hooks and Travis Wall and like my friends and myself to be names that are known outside of our little 
you know, dancer universe. And then I made three episodes <laughs> and, ra- <laughs> and ran out of money. <laughs> and they're all on YouTube. I would have done it very differently now in retrospect. But I think that <laughs> maybe partially because of those three episodes, but certainly because of our community and pop culture the, where it is right now, dancers' names are household names. And I don't use that word too lightly. I think that dancers are celebrities. Um, and I would count them among, I would count you among them, even if that makes you uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> um, but do you feel pressure of a limelight or uh, what's your kind of take on dancers as celebrities? Um, I, hmm, I definitely, I don't take myself that seriously that like (laughs) I I do what I do in spite of having limelight on me and I definitely I realized recently that my what excited me about being a professional dancer was not performing or having an audience or working with celebrities I just freaking love doing choreography (laughs) like I love the act of having choreography put on me and trying to perfect it Mm -hmm. and so I'm like I really have never enjoyed um attention I guess so so I recognize that for example if I if I um am teaching a class and I demonstrate the routine Mm -hmm. that the students will learn how I want it executed if I demonstrate it. Cause I would think like, if I took Wade's class and, nev- and Wade never demonstrated the re- choreography. It's like, if you see him do it, you're like, <laughs> so like I recognize that there's that, like that's as much kind of attention as I enjoy having on me. Um, and I'm F- dancers Alliance, for example, mm-hmm. you know, there's PowerPoint presentations that, I did with a thousand people out in the audience and a lot of public speaking. And I think mm-hmm. a lot of people would go for, for so many people, you'd rather do a dance solo than have to publicly speak. And I have zero fear of public speaking if I'm speaking about something that I really care about. And so doing something like teaching classes or doing the intensives, I am extremely introverted and don't like attention on me as a person, but I really love and can speak all day about things that I care about and know inside and out. So it's kind of, I don't know if that helps like paint the picture Mm -hmm. of in spite of the, I'm not doing it because of um, having people listen to me, but in spite of that, I'm able to communicate things that I care about and that I know will help people and with both dancers alliance and the intensives it's i'm doing it knowing that the person listening is going to take that information and do something with it so it's for it's to help people Mm -hmm. um yeah so i I recognize that like most other people who there are a lot of dancers who are celebrities uh and i think that's totally fine there are a lot of people who they want to be professional dancers because they want to dance in front of thousands of people and have a crowd cheering and that's uh so yeah, there are different levels of dance celebrities these days, I guess you would say. And if that's what you want, I mean, people are making like amazing careers out of it. So I guess mm-hmm. it's a great thing on balance. Mm-hmm. I, I like this concept um, in spite of something, not because of something with regards to, uh, shall we call it the limelight or, you know, mass mass appeal or virality, maybe, I don't know, maybe is a better word. Yeah. Um, But that's a, it's a good moment for people listening, maybe to take stock and pause um, to figure out, you know, why, you know, their why, not to bring it back to the why. Um, Mm -hmm. And then, of course, like, take a moment to think about what is it that you could talk about for hours on end what what is the cause that would get you up in front of a thousand people and have you unfazed like what is a thing that you are that passionate about yes that's a great way of putting it dana yeah okay my friend i am gonna pop out right here to recap before we launch into our next segment i want to underline where galen and i landed in our conversation about making choices. 
I think it's important to highlight that a good choice is one that is in alignment with what the job is asking for. And making that choice is really all about dialing up or down, really being in charge at the command station there, um, of dialing up or down, not necessarily on or off, but really fine-tuning your creative impulses and keeping your finger on the pulse of the room um, in determining when and how much of that is asked for, is called for, is needed. I also really loved what Galen had to say about her volunteered time with Dancers Alliance and sag and the intentions and mental and emotional stamina that are required to make changes. So circling back to where we started the episode today, I suppose, change is good, but it likely won't be fun or sexy or cool (laughs) to make it happen. At very least, it won't be that way all of the time. So as you look out there at the world and see the ways that you would like for it to change, ask yourself, what are the thoughts and the things that will keep you going along the path of making those changes? Galen and I went on to talk quite a bit about the insurrection that took place just a few weeks ago on January 6th. I confessed in my lack of confidence that another painting or statue or eight count is really what our country needs right now. Um, And I, I asked her, are artists responsible for making change today? And if so, how do we do it? So let's jump back in and hear what she has to say. Right. I think artists, I, 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 as a, my own individual person, regardless of being an artist or not, don't feel that I have the right to say what other artists should and shouldn't be doing. I certainly don't think every artist and not even every dancer right now has to be, mm-hmm. um, has a responsibility to be doing something different because they're an artist. I guess Mm -hmm. I would say like if, if it were, what do we as citizens, what are we responsible for right now? That's a, then that is a a much different thing. But I think as an artist, what I have, okay. I, prior to last year, I never did anything choreographically creatively that was topical. There was, it was never like, um, if it was about gun violence, I would never do like a piece about gun violence. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I did have an opinion about something, it was always very metaphorical. And I think I didn't realize until last year how important, for example, the, I have a duet routine that I put out called Best Part. It's to, it's to the song Best Part. And it's a duet. And in the class, this was, this was the final class before the lockdown. Mm-hmm. And I really wanted to make sure that people felt okay dancing with a partner of the same sex if they identified that way, or even if they didn't, but just having people of the same sex dance together. Mm-hmm. And in the class, it was, that was like one of the hardest thing was to convince people, even people who do, like, they're like, freaking married to people of the same sex and they wouldn't feel comfortable in the class just dancing with that partner. Mm. And I didn't, and in putting out the class video of that class, I didn't realize how important it is to share art in moments that don't feel like it's appropriate to do so. Because if you haven't been exposed to seeing two people of the same sex dance together, it's exposing you to that in a way that's so much different than if you even see it in an acting scene, in a movie, it's different to see a level of intimacy that um, people did in, in those videos. Or I, I guess my point is the value of just art without it being a political statement was definitely brought to the forefront for me last year. And so I think for you, Dana, it might not seem important to see another painting or another combo, but for the next person over that painting or combo might help unlock something for them politically Mm -hmm. that that piece of art wasn't even meant to unlock for them. Mm -hmm. And what it, what it doesn't mean is that everybody has to just be making like a new combo to the new Ariana Grande song right now. Like that's not, 
if you don't feel called to do that, that's not an efficient use of your time. But if uh-huh. you feel called to do that, then go ahead and do it. I think the problem is if you feel like you are pressured to do that when really in your heart, you're like, I want to go to this protest, but I need to make this thing that is absolutely irrelevant right now because that's what I need to do business-wise. I don't know if that, if that mm-hmm. like well, resonates. I, well, I got you. That makes total sense. And I do feel callings at this moment. I also feel confusion. I also feel anger. Mm-hmm. I also feel pride. And, and sometimes I feel those anger and pride, like simultaneously, it's, it's quite an experience. Yeah. Um, but I, I actually, sorry, I don't want to, I no. don't mean to interrupt, but it, it, it. I just realized that what you, what you, ex- what you expressed about not wanting or not needing another painting or combo at the beginning of all of the, I think like probably in the weeks immediately following the George Floyd incident, I, I, you know, for, for my entire life, I've loved dance and loved making things and loved choreographing. I didn't want to do jack. It was like, none of this is important. Why, like, I don't, why should I be dancing right now? Why would I make up a routine right now? It's, this is not important to make up eight counts right now. Mm -hmm. So I totally um, empathize with the feeling of like, how, what are my skill sets in this moment that actually will make a difference? Um, but I just wanted to pinpoint that, like, I totally understand the, the conflict mm-hmm. of feeling like what we do as artists isn't important unless it's a maybe either if it's a statement about what's happening or that we need to put that aside to do other things that are that do seem more important. Mm-hmm. But I also um, sometimes the art that people makes helps others escape from what's happening and that can be valuable in doses as well. Right. Right. Thank you for adding that. Yeah. Um, like an, an eight count might not get an eight count might not keep people from breaking into the Capitol building, but so, so maybe we don't need eight counts, but what we do need is strong, capable artists that are able to follow their instinct and in order to do that, in order to be big and strong, in order to get big and strong, we must act when we are compelled to do so. And we yeah. must make when we are compelled to do so. And, and on the subjects that we are compelled about. So simple. Yeah, yeah. I, I, w- I definitely, on the basic question of like, are artists responsible um, artistically? And I don't know if that was your question, but I just want to, say like some people are, their skill is making fun, like popcorn dance for (laughs) us to escape into. You know, like I don't, I wouldn't expect every dancer to have to change what they're doing artistically to reflect the times. Um, So if you're out there and you feel bad, because I think a lot of people do feel guilty for continuing to create when the world is imploding around them, you can, you can go make up an Ariana Grande routine, but it doesn't mean that that prevents you from then getting on your computer afterwards and phone banking or helping, you know, people vote for the Georgia runoff. You can do kind of both. They're not mutually exclusive. Mm-hmm. Thank you for adding that as well. Holy smokes. <laughs> Galen, so much knowledge and so much passion for, for what you do and for sharing what you do. Thank you so, so, so much for sharing with us today. I think we could continue on for hours. I know you're a busy lady um, and we've got to get out into the world and make, make some good stuff happen. Um, so thank you so much for joining me. I really hope that we get to talk more as human beings on and off the air in 2020. No, thank 20, you. 20, 2020. <laughs> uh, in 20, that's how the year's starting. I'll take it. In, in 2020. I'll see you, see you all in 2020. <laughs> Dana, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It was lovely catching up. And um, these are complicated uh, topics that I'm sure I did not articulate properly. And I'm thinking off the top of my head as we're talking, but oh, they're, they're important things to talk about. <laughs> Thank you for thank you for putting yourself out there and for uh, for sharing. Yes, these aren't these aren't easy questions. Even even questions about things that we know and love, like your program. It's always, yeah, it it does take great care, and you are a person who cares greatly. So thank you again. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. All right, my friend. I hope that you are as activated 
by that conversation as I am. I hope you're reminded about your ability to make change and your ability to make good choices. And I hope you are inspired to follow your compass. I think there's a lot to celebrate from that episode and and from the world at large. But today, I am going to close this episode out with a very personal win. Today, I might cry while I celebrate my win, by the way. I am wearing a sweater that my mom knitted for her dad when she was about my age. My grandpa George passed away a few years ago, and of course, that brought much sadness. But today I am celebrating the joy that I find in things that can be made, loved, and shared for literally generations. So, through tears, <laughs> thank you, Mom. Thank you, Grandpa George. I promise I'll take really good care of this adorable sweater vest. <laughs> Whew. Guys, yikes. This has gotten to be a pretty heavy episode, huh? <laughs> well, feel free to lighten it up or to go deep with your win today. But it is that time. Hit me with your win. What's going well in your world? Thank you, my friend, and congratulations to you. Please keep winning. You know I plan to. Speaking of that, actually, we really do have a lot of future wins coming up on the podcast. Next week is going to be an awesome episode. We're taking a deeper dive into commitment, and I'm really, really excited about February and Black History Month on the podcast. So don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss a thing. And also don't forget to keep it funky. <laughs> very, very important that you do that in this ever-changing world. Always be funky. I'll talk to you next week. Bye. Me again. Wondering if you ever noticed that one more time almost never means one more time. <laughs> well, here on the podcast, one more thing actually means two more things. Number one thing, if you're digging the pod, if these words are moving you, please don't forget to download, subscribe, and leave a rating or review because your words move me too. Number two thing, I make more than weekly podcasts. So please visit thedanielson.com for links to free workshops and so, so, so much more. All right, that's it now, for real. Talk to you soon. Bye.